Well, hello. My name's Joel. We're going to shift things a little bit here from the national purview of the Hemp Industry Association to uh, more of a, a detailed look at how a small state like Vermont and an individual such as myself kind of uh, became involved and what type of what type of activities we have going on up in Vermont. Um, before I get my ramble on here, I just want to uh, extend my appreciations to Mia and Susie, uh, Cooper Union for holding this or allowing us to have this event here, my lovely wife in the back there, and uh, my esteemed panelists for today as well as uh, next Saturday. So if any of you folks are local, I would, I would recommend you come, come back out next Saturday. We've got some other great folks. So just to uh, give you a little background on myself, my name is Joel Bedard, and I started an organization, a uh, small business model entitled the Vermont Hemp Company. So uh, I am down here from Vermont. Uh, Vermont is one of the states that is currently allowing the cultivation of hemp and probably has the most wide open hemp program in the country in that for $25 I can basically plant hemp wherever I want. And I have probably six different plots lined up this year under a single $25 permit. Wide open. Uh, all you have to do is figure out how to get the seed. And that's where some of my expertise came in. So my background is such that I attended the University of Vermont. My specific uh, concentration was in agriculture and resource economics, plant and soil science, environmental studies, uh, and even a smattering of geology in there. UVM is a land grant, and I will get around to the concept of the land grant university a little, little ways down, but uh, I did my graduate work at the University of New Hampshire, another land grant, and that was in water resources management. So as you can guess, agriculture and water quality are kind of core tenets to my philosophy and how I approach my business model. Um, in between working around 10 years in natural resources I, and, and to this point of, of working with hemp, I did spend around a decade or so in the IT realm, working with Fortune 50, 100, 1000 type companies. And that actually afforded me a lot of, a lot of professional expertise, sales, marketing, and the ability to communicate with uh, C-level uh, important type people in the corporate industry. So it blended really well from being someone who's just off in the woods 24-7 to someone who can actually go in front of a, uh, a board or be on a conference call with high-end decision makers. Excuse me. So that's a little bit of my background. And now how I'm approaching hemp itself is I saw that there were aspects of the hemp plant that were potentially very important into a commodity agricultural scenario. My, my work with the Vermont Hemp Company is in accordance with the State of Vermont Agency of Agriculture and the University of Vermont's Agricultural Extension Office, as well as the University of Vermont's Gund Institute for Ecolog Ecological Economics at the Rubenstein School of Natural Resources. I have several colleagues there who are PhDs, research professors, and what we've determined, and this was pretty much my doing, and I brought it to them, and right now we're doing an intellectual property swap off, is hemp has the ability to clean soil. It's known as phytoremediation. So hemp's basic filter, filtering capabilities are so extreme that it is capable of pulling he toxic heavy metals out of soil, but also radioisotopes, radioisotopic cesium and other type, type of toxins out of soil. It's widely known that uh, hemp has been used for that purpose in, in the Chernobyl area, and also some of the work being done out in Colorado by, uh, I think his name was Eric, Eric Hunter, who was with the Rocky Mountain Hemp Association, uh, the mitigation of, of mining waste. They found that it was capable of pulling cadmium and, and, and copper out of, out of contaminated soil around the mines. You know, that's great and all, but there are some complications to that. And for the Colorado project, one of their complications is that all the mines are up in the high country and there really isn't any soil. So they had to actually lay down a soil base to get the hemp to grow, to grow down into the contaminated ground. And that's just kind of problematic. And the secondary challenge, which is actually, it's more of a primary challenge, it's only moving the toxin from the ground to the plant. So it doesn't actually change the profile of the plant. So yes, your soil's clean, but now you've got all of this hemp that is virtually unusable. It, it can be composted. Uh, you could burn it, but then you're talking about airborne and ashborne uh, toxins. So it, it's, not a, 
It's not a pure solution. But what I'm looking at is very specific to Vermont. And one of the problems going on in Vermont is that, you know, everyone likes Vermont cheese. Vermont has great farm to table, great, you know, beef products and whatnot. But that comes out at a cost. And the cost is high amounts of organophosphates and nitrogen that are entering the watershed and ending up in Lake Champlain. In the past year and a half, over $100 million in grant money has been poured into Vermont to try and find solutions to mitigate this water quality concern. So the work that I'm doing with my, my colleague at the Gund Institute, and his name is Dr. Brian Voigt, he is a research professor there, we're looking at ways to commoditize hemp in such a way that we can convince farmers to transfer some of their land, their uh, sensitive land or, or buffer, buffer land, in such a way as to both prevent the, the nutrient loading from getting into the water, but also to clean the soil and to pull it out. And, and that is such a thing that, you know, the hemp itself would still have usable capability at the end. So Brian's looking at ways to commoditize it so that we can go to a farmer and say, hey, instead of growing your GMO corn this year, let's put in a hemp crop, either high density, and when I say high density, hemp can actually be grown as many as 400 plants per square meter. So you're talking 400 plants in this, in this kind of a zone, and that's, that's pretty dense. So that actually gives a hay bale effect at the surface. So where you would have a farmer that spreads his manure, if you've got that buffer zone, it rains, it gets caught up as if, you know, people using hay bales in construction projects. So it would do that at the surface, but then subsurface, there would be a massive mesh of roots that creates a subsurface, again, like a hay bale effect, that would prevent any subsurface uh, movement of, of nutrient-laden groundwater from entering into the local watershed. So Brian's looking at the commoditization of that, and Agricultural Extension is actually helping me with some of the design of, of actually the densities and, and what, you know, what kind of specific hemp we want to actually have in Vermont. It's not a big state. We can't have 20, 30, 40 different kinds of hemp. It's the, the pollen alone is going to be absolutely insane off of one variety. Uh, which leads to a third, a third study, actually, that we're performing, which is uh, spatial analysis of pollen drift based upon uh, historic wind patterns. So we're actually developing a model that will use historic wind patterns to determine which direction the pollen is going to go. And that's something that will uh, probably carry over to every other state. And as a result, we're getting a good amount of attention from, uh, from a number of international agricultural research firms, uh, one of which I'm, I'm negotiating with right now. Uh, such that I'm handing my intellectual property over to the university in exchange for legitimacy of my, my business working with this, this uh, foreign entity. Uh, kind of just a little round robin of how to be a eventually profitable business. Um, so in Vermont, where we're trying to do all these things, and you know, my, my model is, is slowly picking up steam. This is gonna be a, a much bigger, bigger year than last year was. We had two small crops last year. And with, uh, with growing interest from Vermont farmers, uh, we are looking to expand on that. Uh, I'm hoping to be in the anywhere up to 50 acres this year, only a couple of acres last year. And that 50 acres will represent the largest hemp crop in the northeastern United States in 80 years. So we're, we're pretty bullish on that. But um, one of the things I want to discuss about how we got to this point and what the challenges are is Vermont, unlike the other states, did not invest in a state pilot program for, for hemp cultivation. And when I describe a state pilot program, I'm referring to section, section 7606 of the uh, Agricultural Appropriations Bill of 2014, that Eric, to which Eric was replying, uh, referring earlier. That is the, effectively the section that allowed for hemp cultivation in the United States. But it was under, under some rules and regulations, and, that, and those were that it either had to be in accordance with a state-funded, state-set-up pilot program, such as what Kentucky has, Colorado has, where the state actually allocates the genetics, imports the seeds, and oversees the entire, entire research component, or it has to be done through 
research at an accredited uh, academic institution. And as a result, I'm working with the University of Vermont because the state of Vermont does not, did not have the purview, the money, or the interest in establishing a, a state pilot program. So the challenge to that is that in a state such as Kentucky, you have the Hemp Commission, or whatever they call themselves, that actually went through the motions to import certified seed and work with the DEA to get the pro and the USDA to get the proper permits to do so. Without the state doing it on my behalf, and they do have my support, we had to go through the University of Vermont. And my wife can attest to this. There was actually a point last year in which myself, my colleague, Dr. Brian Voigt, and my wife, who was an attorney, were seated at my kitchen table with two investigators from the DEA, and they were literally repeating the same thing over and over. You can't do this. Why can't we do this? Because you can't do this. What part can't we do? You can't do this. Okay. He's a researcher with the University of Vermont. That's within the federal law, is it not? Yes. But just because he does his work for the University of Vermont does not mean his work is for the University of Vermont. Literally. We had them, we had them repeat that twice. And it was all we could do to not laugh. And it became clear at that moment that basically they, the decision had been made out of the regional office and the local people had no authority to, to, change, to even change the script. All they could do is just repeat themselves. So, uh, you know, we hemmed and hawed and they tried to convince me to withdraw the permit request. And later in the year, they actually threatened to issue a, an order of show cause to me. And I don't know if you've ever heard, any of you have ever heard of uh, Dr. Lyle Craker out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So Dr. Craker had actually uh, attempted to get DEA, uh, DEA approval some years ago to research recreational or medicinal cannabis. And they stonewalled him for years. And what they did is they issued an order of show cause, which means that as Dr. Craker did, I would have had to go down to Washington DC to justify why we wanted to do research on hemp at my cost. So when they called me up a second time and said, hey, we're gonna issue an order of show cause to you if you don't withdraw your permit, I said, I started laughing. I said, please do. And they said, why are you laughing? And I said, because as soon as you deny my permit or issue an order of show cause, you will allow me to utilize the Department of Justice's administrative appeals process. I never saw that issue. I never saw the letter of show cause. So I called them out on it. Uh, and, and that disappeared. And so what we figured out, yeah, what we figured out in the, uh, I, guess, I guess that's my, uh, that's my joke to the audience. So what we figured out in the off season was that because I submitted the permit request in my business name and not in the university's name, that they were questioning the institutional authority line of the permit. But they weren't going to tell me that. So it was just, you know, needle in a haystack. And eventually we figured it out and we've combined some forces. And uh, thus far, we have one permit already in for the year. And we're probably going to go after a second permit for a separate purpose. Just, we'd rather have more than, than fewer. So that's my, uh, that's my fun with the DEA and, and a little bit of a profile as to how, how it is in Vermont to try and actually grow hemp. The state is absolutely fine with it. In fact, the state right now, I don't know how, how many of you folks follow the news, it, cre it creates a whole secondary challenge. <laughs> As someone who's primarily looking at the hemp fields, the, the Vermont legislature is, is on the verge of being the first legislature to legalize recreational cannabis across the boards. Um, yeah, exactly. So the Senate has approved it. it it's on to the House now, and the governor has already agreed that he will sign off on it. But that creates an, all sorts of potential concerns in that hemp is under the Agency of Agriculture. The dispensary system is under the Department of Public Safety. Exactly. So all of these people who are trying to get in before the mad green rush in Vermont are utilizing the hemp registry program to start growing crops and get their business in place, and it is causing no shortage of headaches across the boards. Um, one such entity came to me and basically kind of felt me out for information and 
described that they were going to be growing hemp for CBD, cannabidiol. I said, hey, that's great. So long as you do not plant your hemp within this swath, which was right around the, the whole Burlington area, because my primary crop is on Lake Champlain upwind. <laughs> I said, I am going to cross-pollinate everything within 20 miles. So as long as you're okay with that, have at it. <laughs> oh, man. A lot of fun times are coming up in Vermont. But, you know, that does create issues. And uh, it's something that we're trying to work on in the background. I've, I've spoken with, uh, with m multiple legislators. Um, I'm probably the only person in the, in the hemp realm that has been invited down and sat down with the Department of Public Safety, which is effectively run by the top cop, uh, Commissioner Keith Flynn, and that is the Vermont State Police as well as the dispensary system. And they invited me down to sit down and ask, what kind of wording would you like to have? And I found that a very encouraging that they were willing to have that conversation. And I know that I can, and, and I have, I can pick up the phone at any point and call them and get information directly from them that they're not necessarily willing to give to anyone else. So the sense of legitimacy that I've been able to obtain is, uh, it's, it's quite validating for all the hard work and all the hours and, and everything that I put into this. And the same goes for, uh, for the Agency of Agriculture, which in Vermont, we do have a little challenge there in that the, the, the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Chuck Ross, has multiple times come out right in print and in interviews as saying he does not perceive hemp to ever be a commodity crop in the state of Vermont, which is absolutely ludicrous considering Vermont is an agricultural state and the made in Vermont, grown in Vermont concept, maple sugar, you know, Ben and Jerry's, all of these great agricultural products come out of Vermont, yet he has no interest in pursuing hemp as a commodity crop. But that said, that is a governor nominated position and Peter Shumlin is not rerunning for governor this fall. And with that, he will be taking Chuck Ross with him. And I even had someone from the Agency of Agriculture jokingly say that I should go for that position. So, <laughs> yeah, but then, you know, then I'd have to probably shift the, uh, shift the business away from myself. So we'll see what happens there. Don't, uh, my head's a little too big as is. <laughs> so that's a little bit of the background of th how things are going in Vermont. And, uh, you know, to the note of cannabidiol, I, I, I do have a few anecdotes and, you know, someone stop me if I'm in my second or third hour here, because as my wife can attest, uh, I can talk ad nauseum about this stuff. Um, so I really did not get into hemp for medicinal purposes. It wasn't something that I was against, but it was more of a, I, I kind of siloed it. And then as more and more data comes out, I'm like, okay. CBDs, there's something there. Maybe it's something I can work on. Maybe it's a consideration. And in my conversations with, with folks, I came across um, a, a Facebook group called Vermont Parents for Cannabis, Cannabis for Kids, effectively. And it was a bunch of parents, of, I think 20 or 30 of them, who have children that have some, some aspect of Dravet syndrome or childhood epilepsy or a number of different different childhood issues. And uh, in pouring through the data I come across, I found a, a report from 1947 describing cannabinoids. And I submitted this to this group. And one of the parents read it, realized that they had been improperly um, dosing their child, their seven-year-old child, and for the first time ever, this child is now 50 plus days without having a seizure. All based upon me supplying just that, that little bit of research. And it, it occurred to me that I can't turn my back on this now. I mean, now I'm hooked. Now the idea that I can help people and not just the land, it's, it's, it was really touching for me. It's, it's a little verklempt. <laughs> so that's just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, 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 of where I'm at and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm actually negotiating a secondary, uh, secondary business contract right now with uh, a business out in the West Coast. I don't know if any of you have heard of Skunk Farms, uh, right? So um, a couple of the folks that work with Skunk Farms have some next generation technology in hemp processing. And I'm trying to close that loop and see if we can get that, get that in motion. So. It's, uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of interesting things going on, and, and on the fun side of things, you know, it's Vermont, we, I like beer. Um, I've had uh, 
organic hemp that I've grown into uh, beer blends concoctions from four different craft brewers. And yesterday, I, uh, I, I closed an initial handshake deal with uh, Whistle Pig Distillery, which is a uh, top shelf rye whiskey distillery in Shoreham, Vermont. And I will be supplying them with hemp and growing organic hemp for a hemp whiskey. So we'll see what goes there. <laughs> so I think what I'd like to do now is just kind of shift a little bit more and um, kind of give some thoughts, some, some, a little more f philosophy of, of where I'm seeing hemp right now and where I see it going. And that is, and, and I'm sure these guys can attest to this as well, even if right now in the United States we were able to plant a million acres of hemp, there's nothing we could do with it. We don't have the processing gear, we don't have the know-how, we don't have the technology in place, and that's something that we need to focus on. I mean, clearly there are some folks who have, you know, bought decorticators. I believe Mike actually brought a small one with him. Um, but we, you know, we need to consider the strength of hemp fiber such that <coughs> typical combines can't harvest it. And you look at, I think it's a Kloss Jaguar out of Amsterdam. That's like a 250, $400,000 unit that gets assembled on site and never leaves the farm. We can't afford those in Vermont. We can't even justify that, you know. So there are major problems in infrastructure and technology in this country in terms of hemp, and it's great to be excited about it. Clearly, we're all at least interested, if not excited, but we need to be able to step up. We need to be able to focus on the next aspect of things. We've got the ball rolling. Now we need to figure out what the next step is. And in terms of Vermont and most of the Northeast, New York excluded because New York's a much bigger state than New England, we don't have farms that are 20,000 20, acres strong. What we've got is 20,000 farmers with one acre. And that is a major, major challenge. We can't have a set of technologists, you know, we can't have every farmer owning all of the necessary processing equipment. It, that model doesn't work. So one of, the, one of the things that we've been talking about in Vermont is the, and, and something I'm exploring is, you know, how would hemp fit into permaculture? How would hemp fit into sustainable agriculture? How would hemp fit into a co co cooperative, collective type of environment where we've got one location that has all the equipment and it gets loaned out or, or allocated as each farmer needs it? And then that same, that same center and I, I liken it to something that Vermont has going on called the Food Hub, Food Hub Management, where they have processing locations where multiple restaurants and multiple businesses can actually go and process all their equipment. They'll have storage to keep the food or excess. They'll do packaging capabilities. And they help you with marketing. And to be able to do that with hemp, I think, is a very good approach for the development of, of the next generation of, of agriculture. It's an international commodity crop. We know what we need to do, but if we fall back into how we did it 80 years ago, it, it's, it's not going to work, or at least it's not going to work as efficiently as it should or could. Um, so that's, you know, a little bit of stuff. And I did say I was going to circle back on, uh, on the land-grant concept of, of, of universities. So the land-grant system was set up under the Morrill and Hatch Acts, and it was set up such that each state would get land and resources to create an institute of higher education whose primary purpose was agricultural research. That is the basic premise of the land-grant university system. For some, you know, it's University of Vermont, University of New Hampshire, UMaine Orono, uh, I think it's UMass Amherst. For others, in New Jersey, it's Rutgers. In New York, it's Cornell. So there is a primary responsibility, and it's written in the Morrill and Hatch Acts, for them to pursue agricultural research. And I, I'm recommending that, that that's something that we look at as, as an influencer into how we move forward and how we get more universities involved, how we get more students, the next generation of people, the makers, the engineers, the craftspeople, how we get them turned on to this and how we get them excited. And, you know, I don't have kids. I'm just going to hand this off to someone at some point. So, that's a primary component for me, education, exciting the masses, handing them a product that they can do something with for a, a new agricultural uh, industry in, in the United States. And uh, 
you know, I think that's probably about all I've got going on right now. Me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>